Mostetsky Arsenal is the largest cultural museum in Ukraine, housed in a massively impressive building that used to be an actual arsenal and fortification well into the 20th century. And this is the museum's director, Alessia Ostrovska Liuta. She holds and has held several board and committee positions over the years and has a master's in cultural studies. Because cultural centers have been targets during the war, the museum removed and hid all of its artworks. But in normal times, it's an incredibly vibrant place. Arsenal discusses what's valuable in society, often focusing on social debates, digging into those issues through the lens of contemporary art. And we also try to uncover what is unknown in culture to our audiences. And uh, paradoxically, that's often the Ukrainian culture because through the 20th century, Ukrainian culture was really hidden until uh, 1991, uh, when Ukraine gained its independence. You couldn't speak about many issues, wow. both political and cultural. And that uh, led to a situation where you, had, you have quite little knowledge about many phenomena. The Ukrainian language was banned from public usage in the 19th century. You couldn't teach it in school, you couldn't publish books in Ukrainian, you couldn't pu publish in the notes. In the 19th century? Yes, in, okay. by, by Tsarist Russia. Lenin thought it was impossible to keep Ukraine within the Russian uh, body without giving Ukraine some autonomy. Therefore, they started this uh, Ukrainization policy which meant keeping bureaucracy in Ukrainian language, introducing Ukrainian language to school. You had Ukrainian theaters, Ukrainian writers, yeah. Ukrainian publishing houses. Why there was a lot going on in the 20s. Exactly. There was a very fruitful period, which ended with a huge massacre. In, in the, the 30s, 30s with the Stalin's yeah. Uh, yeah. purges. Exactly. He executed Holodomor, which is political famine in Ukraine, which took up four million deaths, to curtail this um, Ukrainization policy, to make Ukraine more hom homogeneous with Russia. When Stalin introduced a social realist doctrine, authors that were not social realists were physically executed. And those were hundreds of uh, Ukrainian cultural fi uh, uh, figures, hundreds. Cultural leaders of all types, from writers, educators, musicians, artists, were all at risk of imprisonment or execution, and their works destroyed. Like the artist Mikhailo Boychuk. Boychukism was a modernist phenomenon of the 20th century. After the movement was banned, its leader, Mikhailo Boychuk, was physically executed. The uh, murals were destroyed. Only a limited number of uh, artifacts remained uh, because uh, some other cultural figures, artists, uh, preserved them by hiding them in their apartments. For Ukrainian culture, uh, it was absolutely devastating. Yeah, you just wiped out an entire generation of, yeah. of knowledge and creation. I think it's a common knowledge on uh, Ukrainian cultural scene now that uh, 2020s were the next fruitful period. That's why for the cultural scene, this invasion falls into the pattern of destruction and it brings all the uh, you know expectations and emotions but also a lot of fear and resistance what we also know from our history that um, appeasing the aggressor uh, agreeing to certain level of terror yeah. to a very larger terror doesn't work Imagine the moment when we read all sorts of letters from, uh, let's say, European intellectuals uh, calling uh, to end this war and accept a compromise with Russia. When I look at such a letter, I suddenly imagine what will happen next. I see only atrocities and, um, you know, um, destruction in the future. Learning about our culture now is a part of our resilience as a society. Every piece of culture that is destroyed, every piece of culture that is questioned by the aggressor, uh, by Russians, is uh, worth standing for. Yeah. <laughs>
So in the face of the Russian invasion making it to suburban cities like Irpin and Bucha just a handful of miles outside of Kyiv and leaving a trail of destruction in their way, with the reality of Russians targeting museums, churches and other cultural centers, with museum employees having their own families to take care of during the invasion, Alessia and her team stayed to protect the museum. None of my museum department team fled, actually all of them stayed. It didn't seem neither exotic nor very brave or anything. It was just one of the strategies that people in Kiev were uh, using. Yeah. It was just the way people uh, resisted. You absolutely cannot agree to being erased again. When the war started, what happened to everything? Our team, the team of uh, Arsenal, had a few tasks, major tasks. One task was um, collection protection, to care for the collection, to prepare it for evacuation, to, to perform evacuation, to stay also in Kiev, to coordinate with other um, services in Kiev. Uh, well, and this is, I assume, happening at museums yes. all over the place. Another part of the team was uh, communicating, writing letter, letters to explain what's going on and supporting Ukrainian authors um, abroad. And then uh, a new function added to add to the resilience of people in Ukraine. So in the middle of a war, they got back to what they do best, starting conversations through art. We thought that this is a moment to uh, do an exhibition about this. How do you read art today after what happened to you? They realized that things took on new meanings during the war, from simple daily phrases to centuries-old works of art. There was an uh, old Soviet cliché, a uh, uh, wish, I wish you clear skies okay. above your head, which seemed as a absolutely empty phrase. I could hear it all through my childhood. Yeah. It was such an empty phrase. But after what happens to you with this invasion, yeah. it suddenly gets such a literary meaning. I wish you clear skies, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The exhibition showed works that now held very different meanings to the people looking at them through the lens of the war they are living in. For example, when you look at biblical, uh, biblical scenes, and Exodus now reminds you the experience of uh, evacuation in Kiev. Yeah. And that was a real Exodus. You had um, hundreds and hundreds uh, of thousands of people trying to leave at the same time. A 1980s painting of a beach scene in Odessa now reminds viewers of the landmines buried there. A whimsical work of two nude carpenters looks like a home with its roof blown off to one person, or the promise of reconstruction to another. Our team who was working yeah. in a very hard conditions. But the experience of, of our team were not unique. They were quite typical yeah. of the experience of people in care. So they created a video exhibition of all their curatorial staff describing their experiences during the war. At the beginning of the exhibition, we opened the exhibition. It was very well uh, perceived. So you, you were able to open it in here? Yes. It, it was not as huge as we used to do. This exhibition was much smaller yeah. compared to what we used to do. It's amazing that you managed but to put on an exhibition in the middle of the war. <laughs> this is what we thought too. Yeah, yeah. And also you have to, to do um, rather small, smaller exhibitions for um, security reasons because you have to be able to evacuate. And they quickly discovered that this exhibition was inspiring their visitors to talk about their experiences during the war. There was such a sign that this resonates, that yeah. people need to tell their stories. Yeah. We have a shared experience. So they created a space in the museum where their visitors could record their stories from the war. We prepared a set so that they could put their cell phone on a, oh, on oh, a okay. how do you I call see. this thing? No, I get it, okay. There was light, yeah. there was, uh, it was quite an intimate space. Mm -hmm. The visitors could use this space to record something for themselves, or if they wanted to, they could also share it with the museum. I like that idea of not drawing a line between your curatorial staff and and the public because they have shared experiences in it and it it makes the public feel not like visitors in this space it makes them feel like they're they're a part of it's a space for all of us yeah 
now in Kiev, we are heading to the hardest winter since Ukraine's independence, maybe even since World War II. So we'll see. Hardest winter because of because of uh, all of the gas the, shortages, all these other issues, yeah, infrastructure yeah. Uh, being targeted yeah. by missiles yeah. and artillery. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. So you kind of live in a, a, a foot in two worlds because you obviously have to deal with the the here and now and be f try and be as flexible and nimble as as possible with the war, but you're also you still have to look forward. But we're quite used to living in a few scenarios. Uh, scenario uh, one is catastrophic, scenario three yeah. is optimistic, right. so, yeah. and then you have a middle scenario. So we are yeah. used to, do, to, to doing that. One problem with that is that um, it's very hard to advance when you have to plan for so many scenarios yeah. uh, all the time. But um, uh, I think we'll be all right. I hope we'll be all right.